Hello YouTube, welcome back to the backstory, where we're trying to get the backstory on indie games, give a little light to indie game creation stories, and behind the scenes look at what it takes to make a game. My name is Isaac, and today I have a new co-host with me, John. Say hello, John. Hey, y'all. It's nice to meet you. Alrighty, and today John and I are going to be taking a look at Dredge with its developer, Mikey. How are you doing today? Not too bad, not too bad. Thanks for having me, guys. So, Dredge is like, uh, I've described it in the past as a um, Lovecraftian fishing game. <laughs> That's pretty much um, the main tag I'm kind of going for. It. It's pretty much like a Lovecraftian fishing RPG game. Yeah. So at the moment, you've only got uh, it's like a demo chapter one thing out on Steam, and that's what we're having a look through right now. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, we've just got uh, that demo out. All right. Now let, let's get the elephant out of the room. Uh, I met you, or at least a member of your team, at the Penny Arcade exhibition in Melbourne, Australia, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you showed this demo off there. So what was that experience like? Well, that was like our first time that we've actually gone over to like PAX as it was. We were supposed to go last year, but due to COVID, all of that it kind of got cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no, it was just really crazy just being able to show off that game in front of that many people being directly in the room with them. Uh, I think a couple of weeks or about a month earlier, we went over to Gamescon over in Cologne, Germany. At that point, we were just in the business to business area. So it was mm. just talking to press and on doing all the interviews. So this was being able to talk to the people, like the fans and everything, that are actually playing the game. And that was just an awesome experience. Right. Did you find it useful to do, or was it just too chaotic to be there on the day? No, it was really good because, um, yeah, like our Discord just absolutely blew up after, what is it, PAX? I think it went from just like a couple hundred people and it just ballooned out afterwards. And then so now it feels like we've got a little mini community kind of going on on the Dredge Discord, which is kind of cool to see because we didn't expect anyone to really pay much attention to the uh, other Discord channel. So that's been really cool. So where did this game come from? Like, Why did it come about? <laughs> uh, so basically what happened was, so uh, there's four of us with them uh, that work over at Black Soul Games and we all used to kind of work at a previous studio for about 10 years together and we're all working on like mobile games and then we couldn't really show those sort of games off or tell people that we worked on certain games because of all the NDA sort of stuff. Okay. So we kind of split off and then made our own little company to kind of focus on making games that we actually want to play. And then so we started trying to come up with a bunch of different ideas of what games could be. And then one of the ideas came up from one of the guys, uh, developer Joel, he just said Lovecraftian Fishing. And then the other artist was just like, sold. That just sounds like an awesome idea. Like as an artist, that's just a really cool theme to work towards. It gives you so much room to kind of explore different options and ideas. And right. then, so that was just exciting. And we were just like, yeah, well, we've got these other prototypes and they're all kind of cool, but Nothing quite feels to have that same hook as like Lovecraftian fishing. So yeah, we decided to just keep going with that. And then we did a whole bunch of play testing. I think the original game was going to be turn-based and then it changed up into what it kind of is right now. We had a whole bunch of other systems in place. And then just getting people, getting feedback really early was it allowed us to kind of narrow things down into what kind of made the game interesting. What were some like differences that you had to do in this, knowing this is the demo test version, the first thing that people would do? So what were some of the differences you did in this environment uh, compared to some of the future environments? Uh, so we've basically finished the game. So the funny thing is everything in the game you can actually see in the demo. You just can't quite get to it because we kind of stop you from getting too far. But we did change a lot of other things within the game as well. So at the moment, you actually move faster in the demo when you start than you do in the actual game anyway. You move a little bit slower. And then I think, of course, we've got a lot of uh, other sort of things. That so there is no uh, upgrading. There's no unlocking of all the different uh, rods and everything as well. So a lot right. of things are kind of locked still. So there's a good chunk of the game that isn't quite there yet. Hmm. Was it difficult to sort of make those concessions and try and draw the line of, no, we're going to lock this out and we're going to keep this in? Oh, yeah, there was a lot of things that at first we didn't actually, we wanted to keep some of the upgrades and stuff in there anyway as well. And then, well, uh, our produ one of our producers pretty much said, oh, let's just hide everything so we can leave it kind of open. We wanted to make a demo that would probably be able to be finished within like 20 minutes. That was the kind of idea behind the demo. And then we were, we were worried that people might not be able to get that much game time out of it. 
but most people ended up spending around about like 40 odd minutes to complete the I think to demo it was kind of surprising to see that people were still spending like an hour or so trying to play through the demo we've had some people that have been playing it for far too long it feels like but it's kind of cool it's like all right someone's logged in 16 hours playing the demo I'm like I can't believe you managed to find that much stuff to do within the game but all good we don't have 16 hours of gameplay <laughs> Right now we're picking up, I think, our like fourth different type of fish. So, how did you come up with brainstorming which fish to include uh, in the game? <laughs> Alright, uh, so basically every single fish in the game is based on a real fish, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got, mm -hmm. like, I think there's 128 fish in the game. So it was just basically, we'd go like, alright, what are fish in these particular areas? And we'd just like, literally search up fish and we're like, that's a cool looking fish. And then so we just wrote down a whole bunch of fish down and they're like, all right, these are the 10 fish we're doing in this particular zone. And then we send all that other that stuff to Alex, the 2D artist. And then he would just spend a whole bunch of time trying to draw fish. Uh, the poor guy, he absolutely hates drawing fish now. I think, I think he's worked on three projects where he's just drawn fish. And I think he doesn't ever want to do a fish game again. But I think we'll see how things go and with the success of this one, whether he might have to draw a couple more fish. Yeah, or other things as well. <laughs> well, one of our previous games was all about fishing, and uh, the de de developer of that was like, "Yeah, I just got sick of modeling fish over and over again. <laughs> this fish is oh, this one's got a slightly bigger tail. This one's got fins." Yeah, because so I think that was the other thing as well, just trying to come up with unique-looking fish so we could have interesting shapes, which also made things really awkward as well. Because we'll have uh, Joel, our programmer, will be like, "All right, here is the shape that I want this fish to look like," and then. Alex will see it like, okay, that's a bit interesting. We'll see what we can do with that one. And then trying to get a fish to fit into this random shape was always interesting. Things like the hammerhead shark, which were always pretty funny. Was it ever difficult to balance how much which fish are worth and where you get your money from and how it all works together? Uh, I think there was some, yeah, I guess it was yes and no. I mean, it was all kind of like just... It all came together quite naturally, it felt like, but because we played a lot of the game um, ourselves anyway, just trying to test things out, like, uh, Joel, the program, also made, like, this really epic spreadsheet of, like, all the prices of all the fish and everything Ooh. as well. We felt like some fish were not worth enough, and so it was just, like, not worth getting, so there was a lot of balancing and figuring out how to actually balance all the fish and everything as well with the different types of zones you can kind of go to in the game. Because it's also like an open world game and you've got the five different zones, but certain zones like the fish are hard to get to, but they're worth a lot more money. It's interesting, I'd love to see that spreadsheet, I'm sure it's entertaining. <laughs> Did you go through many iterations when you were designing the model for the little tugboat here? I don't think I went through that many changes. I think uh, Alex just drew the boat and was just like, yep, that's what I want. And then so he just kind of made that boat and it just fit in really well with the kind of weird sort of world scale that we kind of have and then so it just felt really nice made things weird when we actually added a couple like characters in the game that are actually like in the open world as sort of like side quests just figuring out like oh, is this how big a human should be compared to this boat because he's not gonna fit through any doors in this world right. through the whole one-to-one -one scale and everything but it just had a quirky feel to it and just felt real fun. I think the hardest bit was coming up with the different upgrades for the boat as well, because we had to keep the boat kind of the same sort of size, but have it visually change so it feels a lot more impressive. But when we didn't want to keep changing the overall size of the boat, so it's really hard to kind of make your boat feel bigger and more upgraded without really changing the overall size of the boat, because that would yeah. just mess up so much stuff with collisions and everything as well. Right. So, Mikey, what was your role within the team? So, I was like the 3D artist and animator on the team. Oh, the 3D stuff, right, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you'd be in charge of the environment design. Was it easy to create such, you know, little cute little islands? Yeah, a lot of the island designs mainly came about due to how we wanted to design the kind of experiences and like the quest lines. So we tried to make things so it's like, all right, this needs to be a little bit of a mazy sort of area. There was a lot more kind of putting things in, blocking things out, and then going, that's how we want the shape to look like, or this kind of path to look like. And then we'll just work from there with everything, place everything there accordingly. So at least in the demo, the main story of the game is you collecting the artifacts for the collector here. Was that always going to be the narrative of the story? 
when did he come about? Ah, interesting. So originally there was going to be very little story in the game as it was. So it was definitely more of kind of like a, a loot grind sort of game. And then we just started seeing people just wanting to know more about, like, I think certain characters in the game. And then so the story went through, I think, multiple iterations as it was. And then I think the good thing was when we came up with the story, it was always kind of a little bit vague. It would kind of left things open to interpretation, which made it easier for us to kind of add things into it. Our approach was to kind of keep the story super flexible and then edit the story to fit the situation in the game or like how we wanted to pace the game up. It was definitely a very short story originally and then now it became like almost more of a story driven game than a kind of like a loot grind game in the end of it. Did you want a loot grind game and not a story game? I think the main thing that we wanted was we kind of wanted to make a game that wouldn't take us too long to kind of uh, and release and so we felt like story games would probably take a lot more a lot longer to kind of fully develop and finish than some a kind of game with just a bunch of systems there but it ended up working out okay but yeah it's a weird one how we end up like with it being as story focused as it was can you catch aberrant crabs is that a thing <laughs> Uh, so, funny story about aberrant crabs, so the, uh, our artist Alex, he hated drawing crabs, and then so, he did not want to have more to than do he hated any drawing more, but, yeah, exactly, so, at the moment, there are no aberrant crabs, however, there may potentially be plans to kind of figure out a way of getting things in, maybe after launch, if we were going to potentially do some sort of DLC sort of stuff or anything like that. So we've kind of been thinking, oh, what could we do if we went down that path? So we're not sure if we're doing anything just yet, but we have talked about like, you know what, maybe we will try and do something for the people that love the crabs. So who on your team was in charge of writing the dialogue in the game? Uh, so that would be our programmer, Joel. Uh, so he ended up becoming the, the author of the game, as it was. So that was the first time he's ever done anything narrative before as well. So I think one of the things that really works well for our particular team is that we're really kind of cross-functional. Being able to do a whole bunch of things made life a lot easier for us. So we didn't need to get extra people in because we already had those sort of skills within our small team anyway. Right. This is a thing that happens in indie game teams where everybody sort of becomes a jack of all trades as well as their specialty. Yeah. Was there anyone on your team who was upset by this and, you know, wanted to do their thing and, you know, had to learn a new skill just because it filled a gap in the team? Uh, no, I think we're all kind of used to it. I mean, when I first started at our previous company, I was the only 3D artist, so I kind of had to learn how to do a lot of the rigging and animations and stuff. In fact, my first project that I worked on was for a Transformers tower defense game. And then so I had to pretty much yeah. learn how to rig and make transformers transform and then so it's like okay i've never done this sort of thing how do i even make this car turn into a robot or anything like that as well so i think with our team it's just that we kind of really enjoy trying to figure out and learn new things as well of course there was always the downside where you kind of have to context switch quite a bit but i think we all just enjoy doing it i think what i said yesterday uh, i was even putting in a whole bunch of paralinguistics into the game so that's kind of like so all the characters can kind of like grunt and sigh and have like a little bit of more lines to them anyway so we has been the last few days doing a whole bunch of sound in you know, just trying to get all of that sort of stuff in and that's always been pretty fun and a couple of days making people grunt yep <laughs> at least i didn't have to record that sort of stuff so yeah just filtering through the grunts and going like that's this is a this is uh it's not grumpy enough, or it's not a sad grunt. I need a sad grunt. Like, oh, this character doesn't have a sad grunt. This one will have to do instead. So just choosing the best, like, sounds to put in for different lines was, yeah. Took a lot longer than I was expecting. So you mentioned when you talked about PAX that there was another convention you went to before that, and I heard you talk about that you're going to a, another convention overseas after this. Is this your first big, international, commercially viable game? 
Yeah, so this is our first sort of game that we've actually had to go through a bit of like this marketing side. Basically, everything we've done in the past has always been like on mobile and it's always kind of like that work for hire sort of stuff. So we never really had to market things ourselves because that would be the client would usually be the one that tries to market the game on there. And so we're just providing the service of art and programming essentially to them. So yeah, this is our first time of actually going through, seeing what all the conventions are like, what actually happens at them, meeting all the people, doing all the interviews and just figuring out what it all takes to kind of release a commercial game, essentially. Yeah. Did you ever worry about that the game might be too scary, and did you ever have to cut anything with that in mind? Well, I think one of the interesting things is, like, um, when we came up with the idea, none of us are really big, well, horror gamers, but so we didn't really expect most things to be super scary in the game anyway. I mean, most of the fear is literally part of that whole the fear of the unknown, especially at night when you can barely see where you're going, you kind of scare yourself into things quite a bit anyway, and it's easy enough to avoid, you just kind of like go back and sleep. So yeah, I think it kind of worked out really well for us. Okay. So what do you think was the most frustrating part of working on this game? I think it was just almost that whole idea of like wanting to add more in, but not really having the time to kind of put in everything that we kind of want. I always had like set dates of um, when we want to kind of have things done by to kind of meet all of our, our internal like deadlines and milestones. And then so it was always like, ah, oh, this would be so much, so, so good to actually put this in. And then not having the time to kind of put it in, it always makes you wonder, it's like, ah, oh, but it'd be better if we had this sort of thing. So weighing up what things make it in and what things don't, that was kind of, frustrating I guess because you have to kind of prioritize things a little bit because we've only got like the one programmer essentially so we can't put in everything we have to put in a lot of the other things to actually make the game stable and run properly. All right, and to cap this off on a positive light we talked about what was the most frustrating part of working on the game. What was your favorite part about working on the game? Uh, I really liked working on some of the monsters. Um, obviously there's this kind of really cool unique art style to the game as well that the 2D artist has kind of done so trying to make that for one of the I think there's a, a giant leviathan creature in the game and then making that model was super fun so it's like it's one of those things where like I think when I was a kid all I wanted to do was just draw dinosaurs and monsters and then over the years I've finally been able to kind of literally get paid to do that sort of stuff and then, so that was the funnest thing just being able to take a really cool art style and try to make it work in 3D and get it into a game that's actually kind of enjoyable <laughs> so we are gonna wrap it up there thank you again for coming on mikey i hope you had a great time cheers man yeah it's been really fun really enjoyed it now if you would like to support dredge and to play it for yourself there'll be links in the description to all of their socials and if you're a developer and you would like your game to be on the show then we also have a google form below that you can fill out to get in contact with the backstory finally if you like the channel subs likes and comments are always appreciated and we also have a discord group until then We'll catch you in the next episode. It's always good when I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm running out of steam and I look over and it's been an hour. And I'm like, that's fine to run out of steam in an hour. Yeah, that's perfect timing. Yeah, yeah.